In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is the one of whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now John wore clothing of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locust and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region around the Jordan were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Therefore, bear fruit worthy of repentance, and do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but the one who is coming after me is more powerful than I, and I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and will gather his wheat into the granary, but the shaft he will burn with unquenchable fire. This is the word of God for the people of God. Well, each week I uh, spend quite a few moments in my day uh, throughout the whole week listening and praying and discerning over the scripture passage. And oftentimes they take a lot of time just trying to listen for that maybe holy whisper or holy nudge in people I meet and experiences I have throughout the week. Now, oftentimes, it doesn't happen, well, almost all the time. It doesn't happen when I want it to happen. It usually happens towards the end of the week when I'm not as, when I want to be totally prepared, but God totally hasn't gotten to that spark of inspiration yet until all of a sudden it's clear. Well, this week, God was on point and on schedule <laughs> because right after worship on Sunday, I had a spark of a holy whisper, I guess, or a spark of wonder. And it happened through someone I met who happened to be about the size of Cindy Lou Who in our story reading of How the Grinch Stole Christmas. <laughs> Her name happens to be Hannah, and she's a little toddler that was here last Sunday, unfortunately not here today because she has two ear infections, so please say a prayer for her. I just heard from her parents, but she was here this last Sunday. And if you've seen her walk around after church, she is quite a power to be reckoned with. With legs that are just learning to walk and run, I just love her bold confidence running around and exploring our church and our narthex area and trying to figure out where all the cookies are and snacks are. <laughs> and then of course she has two loving and doting parents that follow along with her trying to keep up with her pace and with her exploring adventures. Well, last Sunday, after this space had cleared out, she happened to notice that the doors were still open, and she ran right in here into the sanctuary, and her mom and I ran right after her, and she beelined right here to the steps and stopped in big-eyed emotions and wonder and stared at our two statues here and this little tiny bale of hay with no baby in it. 
it was truly a moment. His, uh, her mom and I both sat next to her and immediately started asking questions of like, what, what do you see? Who is that? Which one's Mary? Which one's Joseph? Where's baby Jesus? Now, of course, Hannah's pretty young, and so she had a little sippy cup of milk in her hands, and she wasn't about to stop drinking. I don't blame her. So she didn't answer. But for that split second, was just such a gift because I looked at her eye and it was just full of absolute wonder of all of these things that really she's seeing from about the first time in her life. And for this split second, it was an Advent gift to see through another person's eye full of wonder. Because haven't you noticed in Advent season, these four weeks that we're waiting for Christmas, that we can tend to fill that time up with distractions, with hustle and bustle and activities and to-do lists, and all that seems to just pull away the wonder that we kind of seek and wish we had. You know, prophetically, it was put by Leonard Cohen in his novel, The Favorite Game. I love how he states this. He says, as our eyes grow accustomed to sight, they armor themselves against wonder. You see, in that moment with my bold new friend, Hannah, I saw how her eyes had no armor. Just pure wonder and curiosity of what she was seeing. Cohen says again, as our eyes grow accustomed to sight, they armor themselves against wonder. Can the same be said about Advent? Because as we grow accustomed and place all of these Christmas traditions and tasks and decorations, does it become armor of the wonder of the season? How often do we take the faith stories and traditions and, and shape them and adapt them and fit them into kind of this perfect box in a logical story that we can package and wrap and pretty, put, a, put, bleh, put a pretty bow on but then makes Christmas very comfortable, but predictable. A box that perhaps, well, armors us against wonder. Yet it was through the eyes of a child, or through the eyes of just a little toddler, that I was able to see the wonder of another. We might just see and experience the coming of Christ in a whole new way if we look through the eyes of someone else as a new Christmas. Will you see Christmas anew this Advent? Will we invite God to expand our hearts? Can God transform our armor to see the wonder of God before us? And then how do we unwrap Christmas from all of these structures, traditions, and, and see it afresh and anew? I don't know, and I, oh, I don't have all the answers, but I can say that it does mean that in Advent, we got to meet God in the wilderness. It will mean listening and standing and seeing others among us. It might be outside of the box. And it will mean Christmas might not be our version of Christmas anymore. Would you please join me as I pray? Lord, open our hearts to your transforming grace this Advent. Allow us to see with wonder and awe your bold hope, your sanctifying peace, your abundant love, and your overflowing joy. May the Holy Spirit come upon us in new ways today as we see you revealed in ourselves and in others. Amen. 
Now, while preparing this sermon, I decided to listen fully to that holy whisper and take a cue from Hannah and all those toddlers to get curious and ask questions like a toddler. You know, I have to admit, y'all been asking for this because you blessed me with an office right next to the most wonderful preschool, Friendship Preschool. And so I get to see the blessing and the gift of seeing little kids full of curiosity and wonder each day. And it's truly a spiritual gift. And so I have a question. My first question was about who is usually in our manger scenes. What are the typical characters? Now, I know there's a lot of versions and artistic expressions of a nativity scene or set, but who are your typical characters? You have shepherds, shepherds Mary, wise men. wise men. How many? Three, right? Yeah. And there's usually a camel. My camel's head is kind of broken off. <laughs> And there's Joseph. Sometimes um, my set has like little animals and cows and stuff. So being like a toddler, well, okay, if that's all the people included, who's not included in that set? Start wondering, I mean, obviously, if you don't put Jesus in until Christmas, I get that. But who do you not have a statue of? Santa Claus. <laughs> I would suggest another one is there is no statue, or at least I haven't seen one, of including John the Baptist. And yet we find ourselves here today reading about John the Baptist. John the Baptist runs into our Advent yelling about oh, this calling from the wilderness. This reading is a part of the lectionary readings, and so that means that there are many churches this Sunday reading that same scripture passage or many other Christian denominations reading it. And we are joining these churches, listening to John the Baptist call us all a brood of vipers. Happy Advent. <laughs> I mean, let's call a spade a spade. John the Baptist and his message might not fit our version of Christmas that we're used to. In fact, some of us might be wondering if there are some similarities between the Grinch we've been talking about and John the Baptist. They both want to try to seem, seems like they're trying to ruin our Christmas. There's good scriptural reason, though, to ask, why isn't John the Baptist included in our nativity scenes? Well, I would love to pretend like all our interpretations of those nativity scenes that we see around our, uh, people's homes and at museums and other, other in churches and such, I will say that most of them are not quite uh, scripturally based. There's a lot of discrepancies, and there's a lot of cultural interpretations that have been layered and layered over the centuries. For instance, many nativity scenes, as you guys have all mentioned, is that they include three kings next to Jesus. Well, in fact, only is, is mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew, the only gospel that mentions three visitors, and they're not kings, but they're magi, and they probably visited, they say, at, at Jesus' home, and it seems to reference that Jesus was several years older, and there is no mention of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So we have this just uh, interpretation that we put on our nativity scene. So why not add John the Baptist to the list? Because I got to wonder if the early gospel writers would be kind of surprised and confused like a toddler looking at our nativity scenes saying, this doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Because only Matthew and Luke even talk about the birth of Christ. John and Mark don't even mention it. But all four, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four Gospels, mention and talk about John the Baptist. In fact, they all agree on the specifics about his location and why he meets us. 
from the writer of the Gospel, Matthew. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea. And the writer of Mark, John the baptizer, appeared in the wilderness. And the words of the writer of Luke, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. And even in the Gospel of John, the writer who is, has a truly unique literary style and different perspective than the other three, he too shines a light on the work and words of the prophet John the Baptist in the wilderness. Each of the four Gospels ties John the Baptist to the prophet Isaiah in the Old Testament. It says in the Gospel of John, I am the voice of the one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. And then here are these sacred words from the prophet Isaiah in the Hebrew Scriptures. Chapter 40. A voice cries out in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill shall be made low. The uneven ground shall become level in the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all the people shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. That's a lot of wonder. Might there be a connection between wilderness and our season of Advent, these four weeks? Might this wilderness is what the prophets are trying to get to us to see? What is it about the wilderness that prepares our hearts and makes straight a path for transformation through Jesus Christ? Might it be the wilderness that we can finally be still in Advent and hear the holy wonder of God's revealing love? You know, I wonder if John the Baptist is calling to us amid all our hustle and bustle of Christmas and wondering what we're thinking our Christmas has to be about. Because John the Baptist is calling us to go meet him, leave it, and go meet him in the wilderness. So where would this wilderness be for you? You know, you find the word wilderness in Scripture, both in our New Testament and in the Old Testament, those Hebrew Scriptures, and it's often really not so much a physical exact location. They don't go into much detail. But wilderness is often not a physical space as much as a spiritual space. A sacred mystery of wilderness. Wilderness is a potent place for transformation. Even Jesus goes into the wilderness for 40 days. And if we take a cue from Dr. Seuss when he played with, he placed the Grinch living in the wilderness on top of Mount Crumpet, wouldn't you say that wilderness is exactly where he starts reflecting in his heart? It grows his three sizes that day. So where or when have you been in the wilderness? Perhaps uh, beyond the place, it's that season, that in-between, a both and, a time of transition. In many ways, Advent can be a wilderness place, full of reflection and opportunity for transformation. In the wilderness, John the Baptist calls us for repentance. That repentance word is a big word, but it gets to my favorite word, metanoia. A change of heart toward God and bearing fruit in Christ. In the wilderness, we learn who God is and who we are in relationship to God. In the wilderness, we are trying to make sense of our surroundings when everything seems to be going wrong. And this is exactly where transformation can happen. The message of John the Baptist out in the wilderness follows the same qualities as the prophets before him. His message is harsh, it's urgent, and it's a concrete. 
That's the thing about prophets in scripture. If their message doesn't make you feel uncomfortable, if it doesn't challenge you, then either they're not a prophet or we're not listening because the prophets always make us challenge. And if we're not out, if we are out in the wilderness this Advent, if we are seeking transformation, if our hearts want to grow three sizes this year, then it means we got to listen to those uncomfortable messages from the prophets. John the Baptist is clear to his audience and perhaps to us today. We can't just put up decorations and do the celebrations and ignore the real work of preparing the way of the Lord. Preparing the way of the Lord does not mean filling our time, cleaning our houses, and decorating for visitors, but it does mean facing the clutter and need for change in my own heart. Advent is the invitation for that internal reflection. Advent takes us a step back, takes us a pause, and asks, when have we maybe gone too far and made this celebration more about us than about the coming of Christ in our hearts? I wonder if John the Baptist would reply to that question with an answer saying, take a look at your fruits. Because I got to wonder what fruits do I bear with my time, my focus, and my holiday traditions? How do my celebrations and actions bring the light of the world, or the light of Christ into the world? Because as the prophet proclaimed, we are to bear fruits worthy of repentance. John is referring to this body, mind, and soul change where we can see the change in the fruits of our actions. He's blunt and challenging. He says it's not a change that you can rest on your laurels and just say it with your words but not really live out. Although he's speaking to the Jewish community of Pharisees and Sadducees, could the same thing be said today of us who profess Christ as our Lord and Savior but then continue with actions that bear hurt on others, that we don't deem worthy or that don't follow the exact version we expect. Do my traditions and celebrations during this season bear fruits of God's restorative love and grace? Or do sometimes I catch myself bearing not the fruits, but the weight? of unrealistic expectations and the weight of living up to a fantasy of my own version of Christmas. And that might be where we can learn a lot from the Grinch in this iconic story of Dr. Seuss, How the Grinch Sold Christmas. And I'm not suggesting that the author, Theodore uh, Seuss, guys, will base the Grinch after after, uh, John the Baptist. He did not. (laughs) But there are some similarities that we can see. I mean, uh, seriously, if someone that was wearing camel fur out in the desert, leather belt, and eating bugs and honey, I think anyone would have an uncanny resemblance of a green Grinchy figure. (laughs) Both characters, though, proclaim their viewpoint from the wilderness and find transformation in the wilderness. The author of our sermon series, Matt Rawl, asked this curious question that made me think. He said, imagine if the Grinch, standing on top of Mount Crumpet in your neighborhood, were looking down on your household below during the holidays. What do you think he would consider the most important to you? Would he take one look at our houses and traditions and think it's all about the lights, the feast, and the holiday wreaths, or something more? We find ourselves this second week of Advent, faced with challenging characters that are often left out of our nativity scene, challenging questions from the wilderness, And all of it can make us wonder. 
Can we take a cue from little Hannah and start getting curious about our Advent? What if God can even work through the wilderness and challenging people? When all around me seems to have hearts that are two sizes too small, what if Advent is a time where we see how our hearts all along are the ones that needed to grow? May this Advent season we see the wonder of God as it is revealed through the one who emptied himself so much that we might know the radical love of God through Jesus Christ. Amen. It is that radical love that brought Jesus and the disciples together that day. Up at the upper room, and he brought them together, knowing what was ahead, and yet knowing that that transformation, that suffering, needed to happen. And so he lifted the bread, and he gave thanks for it to holy God. And then he broke it, saying, this is my body, broken for you and for all. Eat of it and remember me. And after the bread, he took the cup, the cup of salvation, the cup of the new covenant. He blessed it, gave thanks to God for it, and said, this is my blood, the blood of the everlasting covenant. Drink of it and remember me. As much as we want to make sense of this sacrificial love that we celebrate through Holy Communion each week, there is no sense in this this mystery, the holy mystery, that Jesus died for our sins and that we experience new life as we are nourished by the bread and the blood of Christ. So join me as I pray. Pour out your Holy Spirit today, Lord, on us gathered here. And on these gifts of bread and wine, make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. In the 